There's a, a Peanuts comic strip, and often Snoopy in it, the dog, would sit with a typewriter upon his doghouse. And one and most of his stories all kind of started out the same. It was a dark and stormy night. Uh, that's the way that he began it often, and it was the way in this particular uh, writing he had also started. When in walked Lucy, Lucy was rude at best, opinionated often, and she reached up and grabbed the sheet of paper out of the typewriter and looked at it and said, you stupid dog, that is the dumbest thing I've ever read. Who ever heard of such a silly way to begin a story? Don't you know that all good stories begin once upon a time? And with that, she got the paper and rolled it into a ball and threw it away. Snoopy contemplated for a second, put it in a new piece of paper and typed out, once upon a time, it was a dark and stormy night. <laughs> We're going to start there in our story today. Because I believe too often we forget that there's dark moments in Scripture. Moments that we wouldn't want to be a part of. Moments that, frankly, are hard. We've just come out of knowing that we are in the midst of this great feast. Um, if you looked back in your Bible at chapter 7, you would see that this is the festival or feast of shelters. People would set out a shelter next to their house. They would live outside. They would celebrate throughout this whole time of this festival. And each day they would celebrate different things. As time went on, we talked that um, you would see a ceremony where the priest would take a pitcher down to the Pool of Siloam and would dip water and take it up to the Temple Mount and pour it upon the altar. Thus, Jesus says, I am the living water. Anybody who drinks from me will never have to go back. In this moment, Jesus is in the midst of this festival, the shelters. And he sits down to teach, but I want to take a step back before we take the step forward. And it, we just heard that um, people have begun to question Jesus. It's gone before the Pharisees. Nicodemus is questioning, can they judge this Jesus without first kind of really making sure they know who he is? And they go, you should test it, Nicodemus. Nothing good comes out of Galilee. And it says this, that each one went to his own house. And then we pick up there in John chapter 8, verse 1. It says, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. We know that the Mount of Olives is a special place for Jesus. He often would spend time there praying. If you can imagine a, if you were to stand at the Mount of Olives and look down, there's a valley that eventually leads up to the Temple Mount. So if you left the Mount of Olives, you would have to go down before ascending into uh, the, the area that you would worship God at. So Jesus is across the valley. He is praying and he has a good view of the Temple Mount as well as everywhere along this valley. And it says at dawn, he went to the temple again and all the people were coming to him and he sat down and began to teach them. This is a really interesting moment. Here's Jesus in the temple, sitting, talking, preaching, encouraging. And in verse three, it says this, then the scribes and Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, making her stand in the center. So you can just imagine They've pushed into the crowd who is sitting and listening to Jesus. Verse 4, teacher, they said to him, this woman was caught in the act of committing adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? And I want you to know for a second, two things. Verse 6 tells us they asked this in order to trap him. I think it's fascinating in order that they may have evidence to accuse him. I want to stop there for a second. They brought the woman. They've placed her in the middle of the temple, in the middle of the people, in front of Jesus, and they've called him teacher, which is interesting. That was a mistake. To call him a teacher inside the temple is a mistake. But here they are. You know what else they brought with them? Stones. Never forget this part. They have brought the woman into the temple to stone her. <laughs> you don't do that in the temple. They're in the wrong place. They've addressed the Messiah correctly, but with the wrong tone. 
and they have the wrong motives. They've brought darkness into the temple. So here they are, scribes. Here they are, Pharisees. And they have put Jesus to the test. The end of verse 6 says, Jesus stooped down and started writing on the ground with his finger. When they, pers- when they persisted in questioning him, he stood up and said to them, the one without sin among you should be the first to throw a stone at her. Amen. Then he stooped down again and continued riding on the ground. When they heard this, they left one by one, starting with the older men. Only he was left with the woman at the center. When Jesus stood up, he said to, him, said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, Lord, she answered. Neither do I condemn you, Jesus said. Go, and from now on, do not sin anymore. This is not a one-off moment. The crowd is still there. Only the scribes and Pharisees have left. The woman is still standing. Still shame is holding over her like a cloud. Everybody in this room and in this space now knows she is an adulterous woman. She would be known for this. And Jesus does something that no scribe or Pharisee would ever do. Forgive her. This is a dark moment. But there is somebody that's going to leave this space and be changed forever. And it wasn't just the adulterous woman. It was every person in that crowd. It was every Pharisee. It was every scribe. Every single person that entered into the temple that day to hear from Jesus heard from him. And it changed everything. Right on the heels of this, Scripture tells us this in verse 12. Jesus spoke again to them. I'm the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, "Uh, you're testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not valid. Even if I testify about myself, Jesus replied, my testimony is true because I know where I come from and where I'm going, but you don't know where I come from or where I'm going. You judge by human standards. I judge no one. And if I do judge, my judgment is true because it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. Even in your law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. I'm the one who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. Then they asked him, where's your father? (laughs) You know neither me nor my father, Jesus answered. If you knew me, you would also know my father. He spoke these words by the treasury while teaching in the temple, but no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. This is a pivotal darkness moment, but it matters what Jesus says. Because during this festival, another thing happens. At the end of this great festival, they would take candles and they would set them in the women's quarters in the windows. And when they were lit up, they would dance before God in praise of his name. They would celebrate that God was the same God that gave them water in the desert as he was that pillar of fire by night. And so they celebrate God. Make no mistake, Jesus shows up at dawn. So darkness is there. And darkness followed him into the temple as they brought an adulterous woman hoping to entangle Jesus or getting him to say something contrary to what God would say. But Jesus couldn't do that. Why? Because he's God. And so he speaks to them with authority and it changes the very room. Who knows what he wrote? It could have been the sins of the people there. It could have been questions about how they found this woman in the act of adultery. It could be why they brought stones into the temple. Who knows? All we do know is this. In that dark moment, Jesus uses words that everybody in that space would understand. I am the light of the world. When light shows up, darkness flees. You know, I think when you and I start to study our Bible with truth, with 
actually diving deeper into text, it starts to reveal something about our Jesus. He was no fool. He knew exactly what he was saying and why he was saying it. And when we understand the context of what's happening, we understand that Jesus always used moments to teach very valuable lessons. Not only was he the water that never ran dry, he was the light amongst darkness. We should never let our agendas trump Jesus' presence. You see, the scribes and the Pharisee, and even this woman caught in the act of adultery, should have been in the temple that day to hear Jesus. Instead, they allowed their agendas to take over, and it ruined everyone in this story. You know, we don't hear the stories of those that were sitting and listening to Jesus. We just know that people gathered in that court that day and sat at the feet of a teacher. And he happened to be the best. Jesus always does something, though. Jesus always invites us to leave sin behind. With the woman caught in the act of adultery in this moment, her life was flashing before her eyes. Who knows her full backstory? Was she a woman that was always caught in the act of adultery, or was this a one-off moment that she thought she would get away with? We don't know. What we do know is this, she was caught. And I don't know about your life, if you've ever been caught in your sin, it's devastating. It's, it it just wrecks us. And here, not only was this woman caught in the act of sin, it should have been rebuked. In fact, according to scripture, should have been stoned. That's the law. They had every right to take that woman in the street to declare to everybody there, this woman is an adulteress, and they were to stone her then and there. It never would have made our Bible. It happened all the time. But this day they wanted to set an example. They wanted to declare that they were better than Jesus, that they knew more than Jesus, and that maybe his compassion and love that he's shown Uh, showed before people would make him step away from the law. The problem is he is the law. He wrote it. He knows it. He lives it. He never broke it. And no other man that day holding a stone could say that. So Jesus takes his moment and he invites the men holding stones to leave their sin behind as well. Don't ever forget that. He tells the adulterous woman, go and sin no more. But what does he say to the men holding the stones? He who has no sin, let him be the first to throw a rock. Go and sin no more. You can hear the rocks hit the ground. You just imagine in her weeping, in her brokenness, in her sheer and utter disastrous moment as her tears are falling, hearing a voice say, woman, where are your accusers now? Who are these men? Scribes and Pharisees. They're not supposed to have sin. Right? These are the men that were supposed to be anti-sin. They taught people how not to sin. Aren't they supposed to be perfect and Jesus says look around woman where are those that condemn you and then she says the wrong words no one because Jesus has to correct her he says oh neither do I condemn you but listen here daughter don't go back Don't go back to that sin. And then he turns as if to see the candles being put in those window sills in the female court. And he says, I'm the light of the world. Listen, this is mind blowing that Jesus would start to show a lost world that he was different. And that darkness was everywhere around them. 
Let's look back one more time to why they're doing what they're doing in this moment. Leviticus 23, verse 39 says, You are to celebrate the Lord's festival. On the 15th day of the seventh month, for seven days, after you've gathered the produce of the land, there will be complete rest on the first day and a complete rest on the eighth day. And on the first day, you're to take the product of majestic trees, palm frauds, bows of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and rejoice before the Lord for seven days. You're to celebrate it as a festival of the Lord seven days each year. This is a permanent statute for you throughout your generations. Celebrate it on the seventh month. You're to live in shelters for seven days. All the natural born of Israel must live in shelters so that your generations may know that I made the Israelites live in shelters when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I'm the Lord your God. So Moses declared the Lord's appointed times to the Israelites. This is why they do this. It was to remind them of how God had brought them out. They were in captivity. They had lived generations in captivity. And now God had brought them into the wilderness and they lived and moved as he pleased. And he says, now you're in the promised land, don't ever forget. I'm the Lord who brought you out. We need to remind ourselves of something today as well. Jesus should, but Jesus is a guide for our lives. I, I toyed with how to write that because I left an A there on purpose. Because Jesus being the guide of your life is an option he gives you. It should really read Jesus is the God for our lives. But frankly, that wouldn't be a true statement because so many of us choose not to let him guide our lives. We instead choose paths of our own self-righteousness like those that brought stones into the temple or lives of sinfulness like the woman caught in the act of adultery or maybe even the path of judgment like those that probably sat in that crowd saying, yeah, we should stone this kind of woman. Again, I always wish that one of the disciples would have said, and this is what Jesus wrote. But what he wrote was enough. What he wrote was powerful. But what he wrote is the same thing he writes today for you. And it's a question, who guides your life? Who guides you? Whom is the driver of your life? Who is the person that gets to speak over you? 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10 says this, This is the message we have heard from him and declared to you, God is light. There is absolutely no darkness in him. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet we walk in darkness, we are lying and not practicing the truth. If we walk in the light as he is himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus' Son cleanses us from all of our sins. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Do you see that exhibited in this story today? That when we walk in the light, we start to experience something that we could never in the dark. And that's that Jesus forgives us and leads us. It's what those that entered the temple that day needed and they just didn't know it yet. And he gave the opportunity to understand it by saying, I am the light of the world. William Williams went to college in the 1800s. He wanted to be a doctor, but while he was in school, he decided instead he wanted to be a minister. He spent the rest of his life behind pulpits and writing poems and hymns. His ministry led him to preach before thousands. It also led him to getting beaten by mobs. One of his works entitled, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. You've never probably heard it, but any of our Methodist friends probably have. He shares his thoughts of serving and suffering for the cause of Christ. It says this, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. That day, 
Jesus knew it was about to come into the Temple Mount. He knew there was a woman out there who was caught in the act of adultery long before he left the garden. He knew the hearts of the Pharisees and scribes that would come and meet him there. But I think he also knew one more thing. The heart of the person sitting and listening, hoping that Jesus wouldn't call their sin out either. Today, that may be you. I mean, if we're being honest in this room today, we hope and pray that our sins are never made public. Because if they are, we would be devastated. But let me just tell you something today. Today is a good day to take your sin and let it see light. Because when we take our sin to the light, we get to experience Jesus. Now, I want you to know something that Jesus is going to tell you today. Number one, he can forgive you and will. But number two, don't go back. Don't go back. Go and sin no more. It's the hardest thing our culture doesn't really get about Jesus. You see, a relationship with Jesus calls us to go and sin no more. Doesn't mean that you won't struggle, you will. Because in this life, you will have trouble. We know that. But we serve a Savior who has overcome it. We serve a Savior that stands and waits for you to be brought into the middle of a circle, accused with your life flashing before your eyes. And he lights the lamp and says, I am the light. I expose the darkness. And I can forgive the darkness. Don't sin anymore. Amen. I want you to know something about my life. I'm a sinner saved by grace. Amen. It's nothing I could do on my own. The pulpit does not make me holy. It is a calling, a profession, but nothing about me being the preacher of a church makes me a Christian. Amen. Jesus does. And the same Jesus I need is the same Jesus you need. And let me tell you about my life. I wish I could tell you I'm 100% never going to sin again. I pray that, but I know the truth. There's going to be a time where I give in to temptation and I sin. The beauty of my life is found in this. I just keep going back to the light. And every time I go back to the light, Jesus says, Go and sin no more. I can forgive you. Go and sin no more. Let me just tell you how many times I've gone back to the light like that. Too many times, and I'm proud to tell you today of. But keep going back to the light. 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 You're going to discover this. You'll never want to leave it. You never want to leave the light as soon as you're exposed to it. So keep going back to the light. Today, whether you found yourself the woman caught in the act of sin, as a judgmental person with a stone in your hand ready to accuse others of their sin, knowing full and well, like Paul said, that they should have probably pulled the plank out of their own eye first before trying to take the speck out of her eye. All of us in this room have one thing in common. Every single person in this story of our text today and in this room this morning need the light of Christ. And you need to go to the light. Whether you feel like your sin has gone too far and you've been labeled, or you feel like you just toyed with sin but it's not that bad, we all need the light. Come to the light today. I pray for you. I pray that right now, right where you are, you would take a moment that you would just review your life's actions, your backstory, and know that you and I have something in common. We have both sinned and messed up. The second is this, because of what Jesus did on the cross, he can forgive our sins and cleanse us, as we just read, from all unrighteousness. But to do that is a simple step called faith. If you will believe in your heart, and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you'll be saved. Would you do that today? 
right here in this room, wherever you may be, whether you're sitting here or you're watching from home or online, right where you are, would you do that right where you are? Just do that inventory. Lord, I know I've got sin in my life, and I need forgiveness from that sin, and only you can do it, Lord. So today, I believe with my heart you are who you say you are, and I confess with my mouth that you are Lord. If you'll do that, you can be saved, and you should do it right now. I want to pray for you, and then I and some friends are going to be here, and we'd love to talk to you about what the next steps of faith look like. We're excited that today, maybe perhaps you gave your life to the Lord. We'd love to celebrate that with you. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I pray that in this room, there is somebody that may have wandered far from you, but Lord, there is never a distance too far. There's never been a sin too bad. Lord, and there's never a world that accuses enough for Jesus not to stand and say, neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. Lord, I believe that today there should be some first steps in this room. Steps towards you like never before. Steps of faith. Steps of obedience to you. And Lord, that today you would just show us through your word how richly you love the people you created. So Jesus, would you move mightily in these moments. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.